What is up, everybody? Josh Tapp here again, and welcome back to the Lucky Titan. And today we're here with Doug Stannert. I'm so excited to have this guy here. I wanted to read his bio for you guys because it was just so amazing. I'm really excited to have this guy on. So it says, Doug Stannert is the president and CEO of the Leaders Institute, LLC, and has been a speaker and a trainer for over 20 years. Doug has consulted with over 400 of the Fortune 500 and delivered keynote speeches and coaching services to executive groups around the world. And I also have to throw in here for everybody, this guy has gotten over a million downloads on his podcast. He's written multiple books that have been amazing books, providing real true value to people. And they're just rock solid, amazing leadership content. So Doug, I'm excited to have you here. Say what's up to everybody and we'll hop in. Oh, thanks, Josh. Josh, I want to hug myself now, man. That sounds, that, that was pretty, that's a, <laughs> he's like, I got to pat myself wow, on the I'm back. I'm like, God, dude, this guy's awesome. Right? <laughs> <laughs> no, thanks, for the, thanks for the great intro though. Appreciate it. Yeah, not a problem. And I, I honestly have to say to everybody, and for most of you who listen to this probably don't know this, but the very first business I did was actually in the leadership space. So oh, yeah. I have part of my heart still lies in that space. Um, and I realized that it was such a crowded space because there's a lot of people just regurgitating what they've heard from Tony Robbins or somebody right. else. But what Doug provides everybody more than anybody else is that he's providing real life experience and real, what I would say, his own valuable creative content. So I am excited about that. So nice. I do have to ask you this, Doug, podcaster to podcaster, what, where do you get the inspiration for that content to provide real content that you're not just regurgitating? Uh, uh, well, okay. Like you're saying that life experience is really, is really key. I mean, the, like, for instance, I mean, I was a, I was a pretty good teacher in the very beginning, but I got much better after a year and much better a year later. So I'm constantly trying to kind of reinvent, create something new because things are changing. How do we adapt to those changes that are in the marketplace and that kind of thing? So basically, it's, it's funny because, um, you know, I'm up to like on, on one of my podcasts, we're up to like almost 250 episodes and wow. I can now go back to some of those earlier ones that I did when I, I thought I knew it all. I mean, I've been teaching for 20 years. I've been doing this stuff for 20 years before I started my first podcast. And I go back and listen to like episode number 10 or episode number 20 and go, wow, things have changed a lot in the last three and a half years since I recorded that. I got to update that thing, right? And, and it's funny because I think that's what a lot of folks that are really good at, at creating good blogs do. You know, they're, they're going back to the, the stuff that they've done in the past. Maybe what they had earlier has kind of changed or, or, or we're seeing it from a totally different perspective. And so it's all, even what's old is new again, a lot of times. And then especially when something like a pandemic hits and, things change dramatically, then all of a sudden you have to kind of reinvent pretty much everything that you do. So it's, it's, it's a constant, uh, it, I think it's a fun process though, to kind of keep going back and, and revisiting some of the stuff that we've, that we, that we thought were absolutely true in the past and then kind of improve on that and find new ways to do it and, and look at, look at the way the world has changed and the markets have changed and, and just adapt. So that's, that's, it's fun for me. So I continue to do that as much as I can. Right. And I, I love that, that you've, you've done that by, by refreshing the content that we were talking about this beforehand, because it's kind of funny. Everybody thinks there's all these new concepts being introduced into the world, but there's very few. And it's kind of funny to me. I mean, Simon Sinek's a great example of this because he's an excellent presenter. He does an amazing job of, of teaching, you know, the power of why, but what was so sure. funny is that that's been around for centuries. I mean, you've got Napoleon Hill who's talked about it and all these people, he just, Re, he taught the same concept with his own stories and his own take. And that's what people loved and they, they stuck to. And, yeah. and I want to ask you this, Doug, because you, know, you have helped so many people with presentations, helping them become good leaders when it comes to presenting. So what are some of the key factors you see in helping somebody present in a way that actually honestly provides a real result for them? Well, um, there's two different aspects of, of that question. One, the main one is that Anytime that we're going to be presenting something, whether that's verbally in a speech or whether that's in marketing like you're doing, uh, basically, you, you have to kind of look at the end user. Who is it that is receiving this information? What problem do they have? What challenge do they have? And then help them solve the problem. I mean, that's business 101. If you can help people solve problems, you'll become successful, right? And so that's, that's kind of the key thing. So when we're designing a presentation, a lot of times folks will, will design the presentation by... The, in the 
the first part of their, their thought process is, okay, what do I know about this topic and what do I need to tell people? And that's the opposite. What you should be looking at is what is it that this person, this single individual that's sitting in my audience, what is it that they absolutely need and how can I help them, you know, get that solution that, that they're looking for? And then the second side is the nervousness part, because a lot of times when we're put on the spot and we have to speak and, and present, we're put under a lot of pressure. It's one of the few skills that you do in your life where um, the first time that you do it, you're in front of people and they're judging you, right? It's like, it's a, it's a weird, true. I mean, when you're riding a bicycle, when you're four years old, you know, it's like you and your parent, that's it. You know, it's, it's not like the whole elementary school is watching you, but this is one of those things that the very first time you do it, there's a, there's kind of a judgmental audience. And so that's, so the, the second part of it is helping people kind of reduce that nervousness. And that's really what we've kind of made a mark for ourselves in it, at, in my company anyway. See, and, and I love that because that's, like you said, it's kind of the, the root of the problem is learning to get that confidence. And I know for myself, the reason I got into podcasting was because I didn't want to be on camera. And it's, we've kind of had a trend, you have to learn it, right? You eventually have to get to the point where you're comfortable with it. But uh, it's it's such a different dynamic, in my opinion, even than being on stage than being on camera like we're doing here. And I mean, you've probably seen this working with people as they're speaking in front of two or 3000 people, the jitters get higher. But this this episode will be seen by you know fifty thousand people plus are going to be seeing this. But the the nervousness level always seems a little bit lower <laughs> because you're not looking at them directly. Right, that's true. And well, I mean, one of the neat things about the the type of podcast that you're doing too is that it's a dialogue. You know, so it's it's a it's a whole lot harder when you're you're the only person talking. So the, a, a dialogue, especially if you got somebody that's that's uh, you know can create a good conversation, that's obviously going to lower the nerve. So folks that are listening that want to experiment with a podcast, that might be a good way to kind of get started without a whole lot of pressure anyway. But um, I agree. But yeah. The, really. I mean, the nervousness is, is, is kind of big, but it, it's one of those things that it's a skill, just like anything else, the more that you do it, the, the better you get at it. I got to tell you, I was, I mean, I had, I had, um, I, I may have mentioned this to you earlier, but the, the, um, the very first podcast that I did, I'd been speaking for 20 years. I'd been in front of tens of thousands of people on, in, on stage and had all the lights and all that kind of stuff, which is pretty nerve wracking. Very first time I sat down to record a podcast, I think I hit start and stop about 150 gazillion times. I mean, it was like, I was screwing up left and right. I'm like, good God, this, this is, this is, it should take it me 12 skill. hours to record two minutes of content. That's what it comes <laughs> it a, down to. <laughs> it was a new skill. It was something that I hadn't yet experimented with. But heck, now, I mean, if uh, after doing a couple hundred, a few hundred of these things, you know, now I can go in and, and knock one out in 20, 30 minutes or so in one take. Right. So it's, right. it's, and public speaking is like that too. The, the more you practice, the, the better you get at it. I love that. One of the things that it was an advice, a piece of advice from somebody who came on our show, honestly, when we almost first started, she was talking about just do Facebook lives because there's no way to have, have the, op the option to stop. Because when, when you are sitting <laughs> in an office with a camera, you'll start recording. And, and I don't know about you, Doug, but for me, when I first start recording, it's even now, honestly, I will stop myself because I know I have the chance to, to redo it. But after about right. five takes, your blood pressure rises, your anger, right. and the content doesn't come off the way you want it to because you're you're too concerned about making it perfect. <laughs> right. Yeah. And and it's more authentic. You know, I, mean, I I we don't edit out my errs and ums and we don't edit. I mean, we basically what you get on the podcast is what you and I are talking about right now. That's right. on our podcast, we do the same thing. It's basically we record it. Now, if I if I miss say something or misstate something or say something in error and I go back and I can kind of edit that out, but for the most part, it's it's a it's a one take from start to finish, and you get all the errs and the ums and it's more authentic. And I think people like it a whole lot better as well. I agree. And it, honestly, we had, we had an episode. I, it was one of the first ones we did where I sent it to um, our editing team because I had been editing myself. And when we sent it to the editing team, they actually left somebody sneeze in and where I said, bless you. And I was listening to the episode. I'm like, oh my goodness, it's been live for a week. And the sneezes in there. That was one of our highest listened to episodes. I don't think it was That's because hilarious. of the sneeze, but if you think about it, it's like, that's the transparency people care about. You know, we're having just an open conversation here. I'm asking you questions. I care about you're responding in a way you care about. It's just awesome. I love it. Yeah. yeah. So let me ask you this, Doug, you know, especially where 
you know, you come from that presentation background, what's kind of the big difference between presenting on stage to presenting to like a fortune 500 executive team? Because I feel like there's such a big difference there. Um, okay. Well, as, mm, okay. There, there, it, there is a huge difference, but it's, it's probably not what you think as far as the way that I communicate my, when I'm up on stage, I don't care if there's one person in the audience or 10,000 people or 20,000 people or whatever. My, my goal is to make every single person in that audience think that I'm speaking directly to that person. So I'm trying to make it personable for, for the group. It's a little bit more challenging to create the presentation and design the right stories and that kind of thing when you're talking to a, a, a bigger group. Um, I, I think the, so as far as the delivery goes, it's not the, the type of speech that you give isn't, isn't a whole lot different. It's just like when, if I happen to be on stage though, I use a lot more energy because I have to, if I'm speaking in a, in a, uh, in a, a room to an, with an executive and single, single audience, then obviously I still want to have that natural energy in my voice. And I still want to be enthusiastic when I'm talking, but I'm, I'm not going to be kind of over the top, but I will likely be highly exaggerated when I'm on stage because I don't want to leave it up to the camera guy to make sure that I'm framed. Well, I want the person in the back row of that big auditorium to be able to see my energy as well. So that's, I mean, that's kind of the major difference, but I, I, I would say that, that as far as the designing of a speech and the, the, um, the presentation style and that kind of thing, it's, it's very similar. I mean, it's basically all we're doing when we're speaking in front of a group is we're having a conversation with the audience. It's just that I'm doing most of the talking. <laughs> <It's>, right. <laughs> so. Well, and, and uh, so walk us through your framework a little bit for how, how you prepare a presentation and how you deliver that presentation. Yeah. Okay. So, so um, I, one of the big mistakes that people make when they, when they start to present is they will, they will start with their visual aids. That's the biggest mistake that people make. They'll start with a slideshow or something like that. And basically that that's the technique that I, the analogy that I use there, it's kind of like watching an old Kung Fu movie. My little brother and I used to watch those when I was a kid, you know, they came on Saturday morning and, and they would be dubbed and the, the, the voice wouldn't match up with the lips moving and that kind of thing. That's like crouching tiger, what, hidden dragon is, is that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, I'm older than you are. These are like, you know, like 19, <laughs> well, I'm not going to say, but anyway, but, um, but basically those Kung Fu movies though, um, what's happening in that is that the, the voice is being dubbed to what's on the screen. They're trying to make it match what's on the screen. And that's kind of what, that's the big mistake that a lot of people make when they're designing their presentations is they start with a slideshow and then they say, okay, what am I going to say about this slide? Right? So we're, we're trying to create verbiage for the, for the, the, the visual aid. Um, what we teach people to do is we teach them to design the, um, the presentation first is it determine what you want to say first and then at the end kind of create a slideshow that will or any visual aid not just slideshow but any visual aid that will help you explain your your content better the visual aid is for the audience not for us as a as a cheat note and then when we're when we're actually designing the content you know our our advice is to not cover too much you know i mean i like that your podcasts are really short you know like 20 minutes or so, right? So you're basically going to cover one or two really key things and people can finish that and, and really digest it. So if you cover 150 gazillion bullet points in a, in a presentation, it's going to be very confusing. So you'll do a whole lot better if you just kind of design two or three or four or five really, really good concepts, spend five minutes talking about each one of those things and you got a really good presentation. That's, that's, that's it's simple. It's easy. People remember it. It's easy. You don't have to memorize a bunch of stuff. And it makes a it makes it just a whole lot easier. But actually, it's it's funny because like I, I like what you said earlier. You were talking about how you started out in, in leadership, and it's funny we've been talking about the public speaking stuff um, a lot. But I mean, we we are. I mean, my company is the Leaders Course, Leaders Leaders Institute, because I started teaching leadership training, leadership courses, and it, it's funny from a marketing standpoint. Um, the reason why we started focusing more on public speaking is just because if somebody has a a, a um, negative experience speaking in front of a group, they will typically go to Google and type in public speaking classes, right? If somebody's a bad leader, 
they typically don't go to Google and, <laughs> and type in a leadership course. You know, they don't. It's it's basically it was it was it was a path of of least resistance, and and that was one of those big things that early on in the company anyway that got us over the hump. You know, we we were kind of stalled out doing leadership training. It was me and a handful of, of uh, instructors, and we were topping out at about eh, maybe 350 grand a year or so, which is not bad for a small company. And um, and we were we were traveling around and having some fun doing that. But the moment that we we kind of picked up on the fact that the audience or who the people that we were presenting to were really interested in reducing public speaking fear, and we created the public speaking class, we went from teaching like 30 or 40, um, like about 30 or so classes a year, to like over 300 in less than three years. And we, wow. we hit that, that million dollar mark for the first time. And what was interesting was that, that um, it took me, I don't know, a better part of 16 years maybe from the time that I started studying to the, and, and about six years in business before I hit that, that million dollar mark. And then uh, we, we had plateaued at that $350,000 for about a year or so. And then all of a sudden we changed what we were doing. We changed our infrastructure. We changed the, the things that we were offering to the, to the, um, to the market. And all of a sudden we, we hit that million dollar mark. And then interesting enough, we plateaued there as well. Right? <laughs> so whatever it was that got you to that previous point, you know, will we'll kind of be also be your downfall. So then we were kind of looking for the next big thing. And it took us a couple of years to kind of figure that out. And then once we figured that out, we hit the two and a half million dollar mark and plateaued again, right? And then we had to change infrastructure and you know, start adding more people and that kind of stuff. So it's a it's a process. And I think I think that those those plateaus that we hit are those things that that kind of, um, I, to me anyway, it's what it's what drives the the whole process. It's that that we have um, it's it's now a new challenge. It's something new to kind of tackle. Okay, we figured out how to get here. Now, how do we go further? And that's one of the chats. That's why I love I love your podcast. <laughs> I, love, I love all the cool stuff that you guys are are kind of getting across to help people kind of get through those plateaus. I, I appreciate that. Well, and we talk about this a lot on this show. It's it's the rule of ones and threes. And you're such a great example of that because we get stuck at 100,000, then 300,000, then 1 million and 3 million. You were almost exactly at those marks. And yeah. it's because each of those steps, and this is what we've learned from just interviewing so many people on here, is that each of those steps require really a complete shift in your identity of how you run a company. Right. I mean, you have to start as the salesperson, then you have to become the manager, then you have to become the investor type. It's it's crazy to just watch the shifts you have to make in order to grow a company. Absolutely. I mean, basically, that's what we did. I mean, we, we, when it was just me and I hired a, a part-time assistant, about 100 grand. That's about what you, man, almost 150. You know, I mean, we I'm almost pretty close to it anyway. And then brought in a couple of people and that that um, and just kind of taught them to do what I was doing. And we hit that 350 mark or so and got stalled again and then was like okay well that works so well let's just keep doing it so basically that to hit that million dollar mark i just started bringing in new people and that worked pretty well um short term but the i think the biggest challenge was is that we we got to the point where we were growing so fast that we were just kind of looking for bodies you know it's like um, oh, okay. You got a pulse. Sure. I'll hire you. <laughs> so, cause we, I mean, we needed, we had, <clears throat> we had stuff coming in and we needed folks to do things and, and um, to, to get to that next one, that, that next, that next plateau, we had to focus way more on the infrastructure of the company. I, I, once, once you get past that million dollar market, get to that million dollar market, it, I don't know. I may be I may be wrong. This is from my own experience, but I'm sure you you probably have seen this more than I. But you, so you can you can tell me if I'm right or wrong. But almost all of it has to do with infrastructure. Almost all of it has to do with adding the the right support team. Stop trying to do everything ourselves. You know what, what we were we were really good at doing those things. That's how we got to that million dollar mark. And then um, we have to start turning that over to other people and teaching other people how to how to do what we did and bring it on experts that have an expertise that we don't have because hey our expertise got us to a million but you're gonna have to bring somebody in from the outside sometimes to kind of shake things up and add new things so i don't know if that's what you see a lot 100 percent. that's what we see it's so interesting because that's the hardest pivot for most people because yeah. as entrepreneurs we're the visionary creative we are not 
the the manager operations guy. And that's for me, that's when we've personally, I feel like that's when you need to bring somebody in from the outside or a partner of some sort who is more operations minded because you need to just keep doing what you're doing to drive growth and they need to be focusing on refining the growth. <laughs> Our, our job is to send the, the mud their way and they pull the diamonds out of it. That's how we think right, about it. <laughs> right. right. Yeah. So, it's tough though. I mean, it's tough to turn things over. It's like, God, I'm so good at this though. And then, exactly. listen, and then, but if you, but if you ask the people that are in my office, they're like, no, he's not that good. At it. He thinks he's that good. But he's really <laughs> <laughs> it's just what you enjoy doing. Right. And that's, right, that's the hard right. part is when you really love something, but you're not the best at it and handing that yeah, off. Oh, that's even, that's worse. Yeah. See, and I, I love designing websites. I actually really enjoy that. It's an art to me and I really enjoy it, but it's such a cheap skill that we can outsource that I'm always being told by my partner. He's like, stop building stuff. <laughs> Quit wasting your time on building stuff. Um, but you know, it's really interesting to your point too, as well as, is that that shift past the million dollar mark requires a team, but we've even seen this with multiple other companies too, is that if you try to implement team too quickly, you're going to shoot yourself in the foot because you haven't maximized your growth yet and you haven't maximized your own time yet. And so it's, it's kind of fun to see the, the difference that there that's there. Oh, interesting. Yeah. I, man, that's uh, yeah, the words of wisdom. Right there. <laughs> We're here to hear your words of wisdom though, Doug. So you've been giving us some really amazing pieces of content here, Doug. So I want to ask you this. Um, first off, where can people find you and find your company? Yeah, well, uh, the, the main website that we have is leadersinstitute.com. And we actually, I actually, I have a, um, a, a link set up for you guys that has awesome. a, it's, it just goes to a blog post, right? I, mean, I know a lot, a lot of times when folks are promoting things, they're, yeah, come to my website, give me your email address, all that kind of stuff. It's just going to go to a blog post. It forwards you to a really cool thing on strategic thinking, which is, in addition to the the infrastructure thing that I mentioned, that's that's one of the, I think, one of the more pivotal things that people do to, to kind of get to the next level, whether you're at that $100,000 mark or the $300,000 mark or the million dollar mark or the two and a half million. It's basically, it's how to, um, to um, be, be more proactive versus reactive, anticipate where things are going. Don't just, don't just look at where we are right now and, and strategic planning, that kind of thing. So it's a pretty cool blog post that I think your listeners might get a chance of, might, might, might get a, um, um, some good value out of a out of it. I, I would agree. Honestly, I went over and read that before our interview today. So make sure everybody you go check that out. And like Doug said, it's not one of those things. It's like, Hey, give me your email so I can give you a piece of content. They give you just some amazing content up front. It's just a blog post and it's awesome, awesome content. So make sure you go check that out. And then Doug, I just want to ask you one final question to wrap this up. So if you could give us one final parting piece of guidance, what would that be? Oh God. Okay. One final piece, every, all of my, all of, all of the, the um the stuff that's in my head boil it down to one thing i you know i think for the most part if you really are wanting to grow and get to that next level i mean being able to constantly set goals for yourself i mean you have to be a goal setter you have to be that person that says okay this is where we want to get to three years from now and then in order to get to that point three years from now we have to get to milestones and set those milestones along the way at year two and year one and next month and that kind of thing. So set those, set those milestones and then measure your results so that you can see whether or not you're moving in the right direction. You do those things and you're going to be constantly improving. You're going to be constantly growing. You're going to be constantly moving in the, in the right direction and you can't help but succeed. <laughs> 